I had nothing to do with that, and Mr. Evan Lauderdale had everything to do with that. <laughs> You're pretty awesome, Evan. <laughs> Good morning and uh, welcome. I'm Lee McLean, very pleased and incredibly proud member of the small but mighty Emerge Learning team. To all of you, our clients, guests, associates, Emerge team members, I for one am very grateful that you chose to come here and be with us this morning instead of all the other millions of things that you could have chosen to do. For those of you who know Emerge, you know that we care and that we try to make a dent in the world, however small, on a daily basis. We are ever learning and ever striving. And while we do our utmost to live up to that reputation, it is important to know that much of who we are today is a direct result of the wisdom and leadership of my good friend and colleague, Pat Snyder. Pat can't be with us today because she has pneumonia. Uh, she's okay, it's walking pneumonia. She just got back from a trip from Japan and probably got sick on the plane on the way home. So we miss her dearly, but it is important to know that much of who we are is a direct result of Pat. Pat named our company Emerge Learning. She coined the phrase, small but mighty. And she instilled the striving mindset that we all share on, on a daily basis. So what a, what a wonderful platform and foundation to build from. And I thank Pat for that every single day. Um, for those of you who know me, I have an unrelenting passion for leadership and performance excellence, which is the essence of our presentation today, Science of, of Success. Um, I, I have the privilege of introducing you to our guest speaker today, who's Mr. Steve Messler. Uh, Steve uh, and I met each other, I guess, about a year ago when we were working on a, a leadership development project, and it didn't take me very long to realize that he would be a pretty good fit for our team. Uh, one thing that you don't know, Steve, is when I first heard that you were a world champion and Olympic gold medalist, I wasn't really all that impressed. <laughs> and I know you think I, I was. <laughs> He didn't know I was going to say that, uh, but he is a world champion and Olympic gold medalist. Um, so that fact really didn't impress me much, Shania Twain. <laughs> but what did impress me is what Steve has done as a result of his awesome athletic achievements and his proven desire for excellence. Steve, along with his sister, is the co-founder of an organization called Cl Classroom Champions. And I've been around for quite a while, and I can truthfully say to you that Classroom Cha Champions is one of the most innovative, high-impact learning initiatives that has endless potential that I have ever encountered in my entire life. And I, I mean that with all seriousness. Uh, and I think you'll feel the same way when you take a look at this short little video clip. Classroom Champions. I'm Jackie Joanna Curry C. It's Mary Allison here. My name's Kim Vandenberg. Paula Ono here. Hey class, it's David Oliver checking back in with you guys. It's all about becoming a champion. And today's lesson is giving back to your community. What inspires you? What inspires you? What inspires me? I just want to talk to you about goal setting. Goal setting. Fair play. The December theme is community. Community. Courage to be inspired by something. This is February, and we're going to talk about respect. R E S P E C T. Right here at the 2012 game site. Great Wall of China in Beijing. I'm from Zimbabwe. In the city of Astana in Kazakhstan. Are some of our questions for you. Did you use a wheelchair when you were a kid? Ask questions, let me know what you guys think. Equality, Definitely want to give shout outs to you know Mrs. Bodiker's class, Mr. Hodgson's class, Miss Gaudio, Miss Lee. My goal in life is to be a designer. To be a music teacher. Give back and make sure that you guys do your part. I still
still shake my head out how awesome that is. So powerful. You know, it's one of those really clever ideas that you kind of do this and go, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> uh, so powerful, so much impact. So I think Classroom Champions is a testament to who Steve is as a person. And the fact that he is a world champion and Olympic gold medalist actually qualifies him to be able to speak to us today about the science of success. So it's time to get the party started and bring him up here. Steve Messler, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lee, for that fairly way too far complimentary introduction of me. Uh, before I get going and talk about Lee's comments, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of a few of our housekeeping things. Uh, did everybody get their business card into our iPad, our iPad draw? We're gonna do that after presentation. That's kind of us forcing you to stay, uh, as opposed to having to listen to me for the next hour plus. Um, other than that, restrooms are down around the corner, exits are that way, uh, cell phones. If you're gonna have a conversation, I would appreciate if you just stand up right in the middle of the presentation and just talk right on your phone in front of everybody. That's usually the way, usually the way I like it done. So Lee gave uh, a pretty great introduction. And Classroom Champions is it's kind of, I refer to it as uh, the world's most time consuming hobby. Uh, it's, right now it's, and I got to do it, I got to start it with my sister. Uh, and right now it's just in the US, uh, but having, and yes, I'm American. I like to get that on the table right away in a room up here. <laughs> I will say words like process, I still can't say process, and, and things like that, so you'll have to bear with me as I go. Um, but I'm looking, I've, I've been up here for nine years. Uh, I moved up here in 2003 to train. Uh, my coach was Canadian, and through my three Olympic games, uh, this, was, this was home. I have my permanent residency now, so thank you for your health care. Much, <laughs> <laughs> much appreciated. And we've got a, we've got a fun hour, hour plus for you, hour, hour and a half here for you. We're gonna go through something that we've, we've really just started introducing uh, to our clients and give you some, some snippets of everything as we go. But before I get into that, I wanna kind of start this off with, with a pretty cool little, cool little experiment that was done with, with some students not too long ago by a, a researcher named Carol Dweck. And what, what Dweck did was she, she had hundreds, had, I think it was about 400 students that she did this experiment with. And she, she took them, put them into two different groups and taught them a skill over a six week period. Taught them study skills is actually what she was teaching them. They were, these were elementary school kids. And over time, that, over those six weeks, they, she taught both groups exactly the same things, exactly the same way, exact same language, exact same methodology. And when, she, when these kids got re-released back into, back into the world, they, Every single teacher could tell you exactly which group these kids came from, whether it was group A, she, they could walk around the room and go group A, group A, group B, you didn't think I was gonna come, you didn't think for, front row was gonna do this to you, did you? And the teachers could actually see exactly what was happening. The kids that were in group A, were, they, they were, their grades were going up, There's, they were improving every day, and she, there was this recognizable thing, and they couldn't put, quite put their finger on it. And so the question is, is what was done differently then? if everything was taught exactly the same. And, and the answer lies in something very simple. Before they started, before they started learning about these new study skills and before her and her researchers went out there and taught them everything, they took group A and they taught them about what happens inside the body and the brain. They taught them about things like myelin and the way we process. And then, yes, there's the word process. And then, they, then they, the other group they just did like an earth science class with. And by simply introducing the concept of what happens, these kids then internalized it, so they knew when they worked harder, they knew why they were working harder. When they, when they studied harder, they, they could recognize what was happening inside of them, and they could recognize the struggle and the repetition that was happening and the deep thought that was going on. And that's what we're gonna go over today. We're gonna go over, and for me, it's very, it's very impactful because to become an Olympic athlete, the detail, the devil is in the details. To use, that, to use that corny phrase, it's, it's finding those little hundreds for me, and, and I was a bobsled athlete, and to find those little hundreds, it took knowing the deeper science. To, to eat every day, to eat the right way, you have to know what's happening in order to keep that, to keep that going, and that's, that's what this is about. And really, the science of success is about, it's about finding performance, those last little bits of performance. It's about connecting 
the science and research of what's happening in the body and the outside world to the details that it takes to become great, to become great leaders, and to become great in anything that we're doing. And we're going to focus on four, four areas here. The first is hypertrophy and myelin. Some big words that depend upon some of your reading, you may or may not know, by the end of the day you will. And that's really the science of growing skill, how we, how we acquire skill, and how we look at the ways that we work, and how those loads happen, and, and how we, we are able to improve from there. We're going to touch on a little bit of emotional intelligence today, which is really knowing and naming, which is, that, is exactly, when you think about it, that Dweck study I mentioned, that's exactly what was happening. Those kids, once they started doing and learning these new skills, they, could, they knew what was happening in their body, they could name it, and then that helped them improve. So having the, the awareness to know what's happening was what made them improve. We'll move on to memetics. And memetics is really taking a look at the cues that we are and aren't aware of out there in society and within our business and how they impact performance and some of the, some of the huge, huge impacts that they do really do have on performance. And then finally, we're going to hit on epigenetics. And epigenetics is the science of the environment. There's this really, really some cutting edge stuff that's happening within the human genome that we can actually take a look at and we can see it, how that really affects our environment, our culture, and our ability to perform at that point. And really, by the end of the morning, what you're going to be able to answer is, how do you myelinate a purposeful meme within the personal and corporate epigenome? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. As soon as I put it up there, I saw some lips. Your lip kind of quivered a little bit. All right, that's going to make a lot more sense here, here very, very shortly. So without further ado, we'll get started. So hypertrophy, we're going to start with hypertrophy. Does anybody here recognize that term? Yeah? Where do you know from? Growing? Yeah, hypertrophy. It's an, it's an athletic term. It's a sport term. And it's something that we use for training. And really what it's about is it's about no pain, no gain. We've all heard that expression before. No pain, no gain. That's what hypertrophy is. It's about being able to push and push and push and push to find improvement. And really, we'll take a look here. We're going to take a look at the, some of the scientific definitions of some of these things as we go on. And I'm not going to, throughout the day, or throughout the morning, I'm not going to feel the need to bring things down. We're going to talk about hypertrophy and keep using that term. All right, this is a room of very, very intelligent people, and I don't feel like we need to, to bring that level down at all. So hypertrophy is when a muscle is subjected to the kind of stress created by resistance, it adapts by growing. All right, keep that in your mind. And then the leadership, you like that? Leadership, that's our, that's our breakdown. The leadership definition of this is when a person or organization is subjected to the kind of stress created by resistance, they adapt by growing. And that really is what it's about. It's about finding ways to tear and repair. And when I came from the sport world into the business world, on a daily basis, that's what I miss the most, actually. I mean, I was an Olympic athlete for 10 years. And I retired after Vancouver. And what I really miss, like, that's a question that comes up. What I miss the most is every day, we used to wake up and know that you're about to do something really bad to your body, but it was going to be really, really good for you. And if at the end of the day, we hadn't pushed through and found that last point of, of, of failure, I mean, when you think about it, anybody here go, who goes to, uh, to the gym? I mean, don't be shy. You can raise your hand. <laughs> I saw Mike kind of halfway, halfway. It's in your building. <laughs> Come on, I'll, I'll pick on Mike. I'll pick on Mike because I because I know him well. I know him well. And when you go into the gym, who are the ones really getting getting after it? Is it the is it the guy on the on the treadmill? I will use the iPad since I have it in front of me, reading his iPad and you know flipping through, or is it the person in the corner? just plowing away and plowing away and getting to the last little bit and then stopping and, and bending over in exhaustion. That's what I miss. When I came to the corporate world, there's so few areas for us to really be able to get in there. And on, your, on all your name tags, in case you haven't looked, if you flip it right over, what does it say? Hypertrophy is my middle name. So I'm not going to lie, you cheated a little bit because you have those already. When we do this work with clients, you have to earn that badge. It's, it's pretty entertaining, actually, to see a room, full of, uh, like a room full of VPs wearing hypertrophy is my middle name paperclip to their 
paper clip to their suit jacket with pride. With pride. Because what we do, what we do with people is we, we let them recognize the, the struggles that they went through as the foundations for the things they know. I mean, you, we all know this. I mean, it's not something that's, that's brand new. If, you, if you're told a lesson or if you have to suffer through it yourself, which one really impacts you? It's the one that you had to suffer through yourself. And I mean, for me, and I, since I won't make everybody in this room earn their hypertrophy badge today, that would take far too long, I'll go ahead and earn my hypertrophy badge. And mine came from our, in 2006, like I said, I was in three Olympics. And in 2006, we had this amazing team. We were going into the Olympic Games in Torino. We had won two of the three World Cup races heading in, two gold medals and a silver on the way into the, into the Games. And we were, there was no question. It wasn't if we were going to medal. It was simply what color medal we were going to have. But going in, I knew we had, we had some issues. We had our, our driver, who he and I have had this conversation, so I, I have no problem sharing it. Our driver was, he was a very, very, very driven person. He was one of those people that, and it, he's, I see the similarities between a high performance athlete and a high performing business person. He was one of those people, and I'm sure you know them in your organizations, and some of us in the room may be those people. Nobody wants it as bad as we do. Nobody wants it as bad as we do, so nobody works as hard as I do, and nobody nobody's, you know, can do the job like I do. And that was his, his attitude, and it kind of split our team in half because at no point were we ever really together. And what happened was, at the games, I can remember warming up and had this massive pit in my stomach. And we had this team that didn't get along. So when we passed each other warming up, there was no alleviation of that stress. And that to me is where teams gelling comes together. On a daily basis, it's not as big of a deal, but when pressure happens, that's why teamwork is necessary. And that's why being together is, is, is necessary. Because at those games, we didn't, Lee didn't say that I was a two-time Olympic medalist. He said I was a one-time. And that games, we finished seventh. And it was this horrible experience for me. And I came back to Calgary and I actually, you know, for six months, I just really wasn't too engaged in training. And I was just furious over what happened. And I remember walking around as, you know, like uh, you saw after the Olympics, after somebody competes, they have to go through that little media thing and get interviewed. And sometimes you think, why is that person getting interviewed right now? They're crying because they have to. Like they force us to go through this, that maze of media. And as I went through, nobody wanted to talk to me. We were in seventh place. And I remember stopping and talking to our hometown paper, my hometown paper, Buffalo. And I said, this is horrible. I'm never going to let this happen again. I'm never going to let this happen again. And moving forward, I didn't. And I took control of our team and I made sure that we got along. So in Vancouver, we had this very functional, happy team. So when I warmed up that pit in my stomach, I would pass our guys and we would slap fives, we'd look in, slap fives or look each other in the eye and everything got better. But without that happening in 2006, I don't know if we win Vancouver because I don't know if our team winds up, winds up being that. And that winds up happening every day. You have to work on that. You have to push and push and push. But if you push every day, then all of a sudden we get back into a little bit of science because what I noticed when I came into the corporate world, there was two different ways of thinking that performance was going to go up. One was, so the blue line is our volume of work. Vol so how, volume, how much we work, intensity, how hard we work. And people thought that if we do the same thing every day, if I work X amount of hours every day, every week, every month, in the same, same pattern, performance is going to go up. Okay. That would have been great. If, <laughs> as an athlete, that would have been a wonderful thing to happen if I just didn't have to have these huge peaks and valleys of training. Or the second thing that happens is the intensity of work and volume of work. We work harder. We work more. You see this? Corporate Calgary has a lot of this. Just work harder. Just work more. Just work more. Just work harder. Go, go, go. Performance is going to go up. All right? If it was that simple as an athlete, it would have been terrible, actually. <laughs> but we'll take a look now at what my training looked like. This is, yeah, I know, it's a lot of stuff on the screen. I'll give you a second to digest it. So, okay, given that in the corporate world we don't have this one time to peak. We get that, all right? We've got here, we're peaking for January, February, the Olympic Games, our functional state is the highest, right? But training, up and down, up and down, up and down in a very, very systematic way. Now, yes, in the corporate world we don't have one, one time that we're trying to peak. We have but we do know times that will be higher volume of work, right? 
We do know times that whether it's a quarterly report or whether it's an AGM or whether it's a project that's happening, we do know and we can pattern those things around. So what we, when we work with clients on this is we talk about trying to find, trying to find that optimal area of mapping out your training, your work, knowing when projects are going to happen. And yes, we can't forecast everything, but we can forecast some things. We know when some things are happening. And then also understanding that when we're working really hard, our functional state is really low. And if we can understand that, then that's OK. Right? But this is what performance looks like when we're trying to actually gain optimum performance. So we try to work around with clients. We try to work around what's happening and try to find if there's a way that we can help structure this a little bit. Uh, you know, we have to, you have to add in real life. In the Olympic world, we don't really deal with real life. We just do this. <laughs> but there are ways, there are ways to, be able to, to be able to get in there. So that's, you know, and then we've got Arnold Schwarzenegger down there. Sorry, because hypertrophy is lifting and, and all of that, and that was really the, the most hilarious picture that I could find that we could, our te production team could find to, to really give off the hypertrophy of, uh, <laughs> of training hard. So that is, in a nutshell, and we dive into this a lot deeper when we do this work, but that's, in a nutshell, the beginnings of the science of success is recognizing how to work hard and recognizing that there should be a pattern in where our recovery and, recovery and our rest and our work gets into. So now is the time when we're all going to get up off our feet in just a second. And who here is a Seinfeld fan? I was, I was a big Seinfeld fan. Remember there's, this, there's that character that was uh, the close talker? Remember that episode? Some of you guys have seen that episode? Where they just kept talking about the close talker and they'd be you know, this guy that would just come right up to you and speak like that. Well, then there's that person that has the long handshaker. You know that person that just won't let go? And you, it's, it's uncomfortable and, you, and you're just thinking like, can I, and you try to pull away. I'm looking at a room of what do we have, about 9,500 people in here today? I'm looking at a room of about 95 long handshakers right now. Because what we're going to do is in a second, <laughs> is in a second, I'm going to ask you all to stand up and look around to your neighbors and, and please just kind of stay in your area. And for 30 seconds, you're going to do, you're going to handshake for 30 seconds at a time. And I'm going to put some, some yes, it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to put some questions up on, you didn't think you'd come to an eMERGE event and just be able to sit there the whole time, did you? So for 30 seconds, one, I'm going to put some statements or questions on the board for you to discuss. For 30 seconds, one person will speak while the other person listens. Not a conversation, but one person speaking for 30 seconds. At the end of 30 seconds, we'll switch. And then there'll be another question, and I'll ask you to do -si do and look for somebody else in your area. All right, so if we could all please go ahead and stand up. Find the first person you're going to, your first victim for a long handshake. Decide who's going to be. And your first question. Describe your first car. Describing our first car. Okay, okay. Switch stories. Switch stories. The other person will tell their first car story. Switch partners, we're going to do the same thing, but the question is now, who is your favorite teacher? So switch people, 30 seconds, go.
I should see we're not holding hands, we're shaking hands. First of all, we're gonna go, we're gonna do one more round. Please switch people. One last question is, what are the attributes of an excellent employee? What do you see as the attributes of an excellent employee? is then it was awful did it stay awful did it, it was a little awkward but then how about by the end a little bit better right a little bit easier I want I'm head I'm looking for heads nodding in agreement or disagreement yes so the question is all right so we know that right the more that we do something the easier it gets right practice makes perfect that kind of thing but the question is, is what's happening? Like what is actually physically happening in our bodies that is making that transition that goes from that awkward, even, you know, whether it's somebody you know is, or especially in a room full of people that you may not know, that little awkward thing in your stomach, right? It's, you know, it's just shaking hands, we do it every day, but it's just pushing past something that we're used to, something that we're comfortable with. And the answer lies in this, this stuff called myelin. And Daniel Coyle in the book Talent Code really brought this to the forefront. This is becoming much more cutting edge science. And what myelin is, is it's this insulating sheath that goes around nerve fibers, increasing the speed of our impulses. So it's how we, it's how we learn. And for our leadership purposes, quality repetition creates skill. And let's take, I want to take a little bit more of a look here at, what, at what's happening inside and then we'll get into really what more of myelin is. And what, what's happening is that every time we do something, we fire these impulses in our brain and the, the, the impulses get sent from the neuron across the axons to more neurons and it gets piled through and then all of a sudden it's, it's, shaking, it's shaking a hand. And it's just like, think about uh, you know, the first time we drove a car. How was that? What, what else could you do? What else could you do the first you know, week you were driving a car. I mean, the radio on was a distraction, right? I mean, even thinking about taking your hands off and doing this. Now, I mean, we could sit there with our knee, our cell phone, and a burger in the other hand, and we can go from, point, from home to work without even knowing how we got there. We have myelinated that skill. Our pathways are clean now, they're insulated, everything's happening, everything's firing very, very, very quickly. Now, we'll do a little, one little last exercise with you. Well, not last. That would be an exaggeration. Let me ask everybody to please fold your arms. Okay. Now, fold them the other way. All right. Exactly. Or hug, or hug yourself. 
<laughs> so the question is, does that have anything to do with, with what handed we are? No, it's just we started folding our arms that way one day, and we've myelinated that pathway, and we're so smooth at doing it that as soon as we, we make a change to it, it's the same thing, but it's just we're gone. We're gone. But if we sat there and did that over and over and over again, and we myelinated that pathway, we could do it and it would feel, it would feel completely normal and comfortable. So as we go on and we look, so what's happening is that every time that nerve impulse fires, there's these little things called oligodendrocytes, which we don't have in the graphic here because they're moving and it's a little bit hard to, to illustrate that graphic moving. But what's happening is you see these, these little orange things we have, and it's actually white in the body. These little orange things that cover the axon, which is that, that long thing between the top of the nucleus there and down, we cover that. Every time we fire and do something uncomfortable, that little pit here, we fire that nerve. These oligodendrocytes sense that. They wrap myelin around. They wrap it around. They wrap it around. And what it's pretty much like is like the rubber around a copper, copper wire. What does, what does the rubber around the copper wire do? What's that? Insulate. Exactly. Makes it safer for us, one, but, but two, it makes it more efficient. It makes it more efficient. If you took that rubber away, that circuit would be firing a lot slower. The body does this. This is exactly what the body does. And the interesting thing is that probably some of us may not have heard this before, because it only, it's only been about 10 years since we've actually been able to study it. In 2001, they came up with a, this diffusion MRI technique that we can now actually look inside the brain and actually look at this white matter. We may have referred to it as white matter and myelin are kind of married within the system. But that's what's happening in the brain. So every time we do that, and it's really, really interesting that as, as it starts here, starts in the, the nerve cell and it heads down, heads down these little sausage links. That's what it looks like in the body, these little sausage links. The more and more we do something, we fire, whether it's a golf swing over and over and over, or whether it's having an awkward conversation. The more we do it, or whether it's standing up on stage in front of people and doing it over and over, Again, I've obviously done this a lot, and I like to talk, so it really goes well together. <laughs> and the interesting thing about myelin is that we can't lose it. It doesn't go away, except for one little caveat, and that's disease. Something like MS or dementia are demyelinating diseases. So the trick with the fact that myelin doesn't go away is that think about the concept of breaking bad habits. What does this now mean conceptually in our brains of what breaking a bad habit is? There's no such thing. We have to myelinate a new habit. We have to supersede that pathway that's already there because that pathway's not going anywhere. I mean, think about expressions like, it's like riding a bike. What does that mean? It means that if you haven't ridden a bike for 20 years and you hop on a bike, you know, by, you get on it and you weeble and you wobble, and then by the time you get to the end of the block, it's as if you never left a bike. That's exactly where that expression comes from because all the brain has to do is just find the pathway. It hasn't seen it for a while. Find the pathway, find the pathway, lock onto it, and it's there and it's as if it was never gone. Does anybody here speak two languages? Anybody speak three languages? Anybody speak four languages? Five, six, four languages. So four, speak five languages. When did you learn them? What's that? Not fluent, but you, but you have a concept of four or five languages. When did you learn them? Uh, started in grade two in French. Okay. And then I uh, was 18 Portuguese. 18 Portuguese. 14 Spanish. 14 Spanish. So as you went, as, as you learned more languages, did it become <coughs> easier? The more languages you learn, if people have, you, you've met people who know these, I mean, I call them slightly obnoxious people who know like five, six, seven languages. It's amazing. So I travel, as Bob said, we travel around in Europe a lot, and you know, obviously the Europeans can speak, have a lot more diversity in their languages. And the idea there is that you're myelinating your brain for, for language. There's, so there's areas in the brain that, that, we, that we do different things, and we're going to get into that in just a second as well. But <coughs> language, and, and how, about, when was, how often do you use your French? Not very often. Not very often. But you feel that if you were to go to France for a month, no problem, right? Exactly. So we use a physical skill like riding a bike. Language is the exact same thing. That pathway's there. It's there. We just have to access it. And then once we build that pathway for French, for Spanish, for Portuguese, she could go and learn Chinese, and it would be a lot easier for her 
than it would be for somebody like me who speaks one and a half languages, you know, English and half German at that point. So really what we, what's really important then is figuring out how we grow myelin. How does this happen? And what's, that, and what's the transference going to be to, to the corporate world and our daily lives? So we're going to do a, a, quick little, a quick little thing here in a second. I'm going to put up a, a block of words. You see them there. They're going to, in case you haven't figured out now, anything that's little, it'll get big here in a second. I'm going to put up a block of words, and I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to sit in your chairs and try to memorize as many of the words on the screen as you can and try to remember which was an A and which was in B. Some of you have already locked in, have already started. All right, so we'll give you 30 seconds, glasses on, ready? Get it all, capture it. Okay, now think, think to yourself, go back in your head now and think about what words you remember. Try to think if they were column A, column B. Okay, do we remember more? More words from column A or from column B? Somebody say C. <laughs> <laughs> the same, same B, B, A. Right, A. So the, the reason we do that, the reason we do that, and oftentimes when we, when we do this work in, with, with, with our clients, we, we had, it's a little longer list, they get more time, and then they're able to write down so they can actually physically see what, what they remember more. And the question is, is, is what's the difference? Missing a letter from each one, right? What does that have to do with myelin? <clears throat> the first way that we grow myelin is struggle. Struggling. Okay, so what does this have to do with struggle? Well, for, for and I should say this, that when they, do this, when they do this test with people and they do it longer, people generally remember 300% more from column B than you do from column A. And the reason is that we know the words butter. We know it's lyrics, shoe, book, chips. We know that. But our brain, just for, just for a millisecond, has to stop, replace the letter in there, and then move on. Stop, replace the letter. Just for a tiny, tiny bit, just that tiny bit of struggle increases, increases our ability to remember by 300%. So what does that mean when it comes to uh, you know, one of our teammate, teammates, or co teammates, <laughs> people on our team, or coworkers, and they have a question? for their leader. Is it better to tell them, and we know, you know, again, we know this, better to tell them or let them do their best to work it out on their own. We know that it's better, but now if we can conceptualize what's happening and why it's better, and they understand why it's better, then they are going to appreciate much, much more the ability to struggle through it because they're gonna be able to myelinate and struggle to get through it. So we've got Nova, Nova Chemicals. You guys in here, where's Dev? Where's Anybody else in here? Go ahead. So we, we did the next, the second, we did the second way that we, we grow myelin. We did this with Nova Chemicals. And does anybody remember their periodic table of the elements? That's not from Nova. Nova Chemicals. All right. Can you recognize what's missing up there? No. Anybody? No? All right. So this is just a little snippet of a periodic table of elements. We did this with, again, a room, a room, full or half full of PhDs who, who do this for a living, they, right away, boom, we got sodium and phosphorus that we're missing, right? The reason sodium and phosphorus are missing, and that's the fun of that one, is that sodium and phosphorus are very, very, uh, very, very needed in the production of myelin. And then what we did was we messed with them a little bit. And we did, and <laughs> Deb's laughing back there because she remembers this one. Then we did this. All right, so to us, it looks normal, but it's actually scrambled around. We've, 
We've taken all the elements that were on that same clip there and scrambled them up. And what do you think happened? No idea. It was a five minute discussion amongst people with 20 years of education in this to figure out what was missing. And, and that was the thing is that we remember things, we myelinate things with repetition and chunking and patterns over and over and over again. So as soon as we took the pattern away that they recognized, their, their knowledge of what was happening on there was gone. They did the same thing with chess players. And they took a master chess player and, not, and you know, somebody who knew nothing and they put, you know, started a game and had patterns of the board and you, they both left and came back and the master could tell you where everything was. They knew everything. But as soon as you just put the place, pieces in place in a random order that wasn't strategic, st strategic for a game, they had absolutely equal skill. So what that's telling us is that repetition of what the information is over and over and over builds myelin, over and over and over, which means that in order to, to gain variety, we need to vary the things that we do and repeat them over and over and over again to really grow, to really grow that myelin. And lastly, the last thing that we're, the last way you grow, you grow myelin is best described in this really, really cool experiment that they did at Oxford University. And it was based on, and it was based on juggling. And what they did was they took 48 students, uh, college age, university, sorry, college, that's the American coming out of me, college. University age students, and they, for six weeks, they took 48, 48 students, they broke them in half, they had one group, they took, they, they used a diffusion MRI, and they looked at their white matter beforehand, and then they had half the group, 24 students, go off and, and live their lives. The other half, they taught them how to juggle. Why juggle? Because it's a skill that most people don't have. This is a brand new skill for everybody. And for six weeks, 30, 30 minutes a day, they had, to, they had to practice juggling. They brought somebody in once a week to help them you know, figure out what to do. But for six weeks, they, jugg they juggled. And at the end of the study, they went back in and they, they tested the white matter. They took a look at the white matter and the myelin. And to no surprise, the, the students who were juggling increased their, their myelin. In an area of the brain, the parietal occipital sulcus, which is, uh, which is right around there, the brain, right around that area, back, back corner quadrant there. And so, okay, no big deal. We'd assume that, right? We'd expect that just from what I've been saying, the more we do something, we're going to myelinate. But interesting was, thing was they didn't myelinate the juggling spot of the brain. They myelinated the reaching and grasping part of the brain. Even more interesting was you had this big group, so of course you had a nice bell curve. You had some people who were terrible. Most people in the middle were decent at juggling. And then some people were really, really good. But what, they ha what was interesting is when they went and looked at the, the myelin, everybody grew myelin across the board. Didn't matter whether they got good or bad at it. They all grew myelin. So what was it? that grew the myelin. And it was the concept of deep practice. Being focused on something and being so focused on something that we can't think of other distractions. Not having, I mean, think about trying to learn how to juggle. You can't watch TV, you can't do it on a unicycle. You have to sit there and, and actually really, really focus on what you're doing. And that's how, that's why that happens. All right, so how does that relate to us? How that relates to us is back what I said where it didn't myelinate the juggling, it myelinated the reaching and grasping. So for our purposes, there's an area of the brain, front, front area of the brain that, that deals with communication skills. All right, so if say somebody, say yourself, is bad at that awkward, bad conversation at work, we have to have those, right? We have to have that tough conversation that is, we don't want to have it, we would almost rather do it by email, but we know communication face-to-face -face is, is more powerful. And we only get to do that every, you know, get to do it. We only have to do it every few months or maybe once a year even. So how can we practice it? Well, what this research tells us is we can practice it everywhere. I torture one of our, one of our partners, Natalie McCauley, I torture her whenever we're on an elevator. What's more awkward than an elevator conversation? Where you're packed in with, you guys are getting picked on because you're front row. You get packed in with a bunch of people that you don't know, and everybody's quiet. And you strike up a conversation. And you start. It's awkward. It's that same feeling. It's myelinating the same part of the brain 
that is that awkward conversation at work. And that's the, the coolest thing about this kind of research is that we can learn that and we can struggle through that. So if there's any areas, whether it's soft skills or communication, emotional intelligence skills, we can find ways to do that, to do that and, and make ourselves better at that, and that's gonna help us at work. And that's some, that's an amazing thing. I mean, you wouldn't be surprised to also hear, and as a random myelin side note, that they did this study at uh, Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. They looked at myelin and IQ, and the kids with more myelin in their brains actually had higher IQs, which makes sense because they myelinated all these different areas of learning. So they were able to process things better and that's, what, and that's what was going on. So the three ways that we grow myelin, struggle, repetition, and deep practice. And that's, the, that's really the foundation for, for making our, all right, there we go. So that's really the foundation for putting the pieces in place to transform the people in our organizations. To transform the people in our organizations, to increase their capacity, to reach a higher performance level for them to understand what's happening inside. So the, now the big question is, is how do we influence that? How do we, how do we, what, what kind of things and things do we do and say that will cause, that will cause people to, to process this information? And the answer lies in the concept of memetics. So memes and memetics is something coined by Richard Dawkins, an evolutionary scientist that in the 70s, his book, The Selfish Gene. And he goes into to memes. And memes, as you see there, meme, unit of culture, idea, belief, pattern, and behavior. Now, if genes are the building blocks of life, memes are the building blocks of culture. Memes are what string everything together, our ideas, our, our, our thoughts. And for, for our purpose, memetics, the study of cultural information, for our purpose, leadership, it's the study of the transformation, or, sorry, the transference of ideas within a business culture. So it's how things move. We may have heard of this before in, it may have been referred to us as viruses. We've heard that before, how viruses spread. And, and memes work in a, in a very similar way. They, they infiltrate, they duplicate, and they spread. Much in the same way it's, it's been equated to, to Darwinian process. The strong memes, the strong ideas will, will replicate. And the ones that aren't so strong or can't take that foothold will, will eventually die off. And that's what memetics is really about. And the general principle is that everything, everything that we do, everything we do and say that influences others is a meme. And it's outside of using the genetic process, we'll take a look at how it actually works, a meme, an idea. So something along the lines of if I say yawn, and if I'm gonna go ahead and talk about yawning and I'm gonna say the word yawn over and over again, and even though you know I'm saying yawn just to get you to yawn, a lot of you are gonna to start to have to yawn because there's gonna be this inclination, this meme has been put on you to eventually yawn, and I see a couple happening, and it's gonna, and I'm probably gonna do it here. And it's been in, in uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. He talks about, he uses that, and you're reading this thing in half a page and you're yawning on your own no matter what. And that's the idea of a meme. It's something that's spread and has a, it has a consequence. I mean, if I, excuse me one second here. I gotta check what's. If I do that, if I do that in the middle of a meeting or in the middle of a talk, does your pocket start to get a little bit sensitive? Or, or all of a sudden something has to reach in your purse? Because the, the meme of that is that, well, he's checking it, so somebody else has to check it. I have to check it too. Or the meme of that is, you guys really don't really mean anything to me, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check, my, check my phone. And that's, and that's what memes are about. Memes are everywhere, glasses. Well, so many people have said, oh, you look so much smarter with your glasses on. Which I do, don't I? I know. American Canadian. American Canadian. <laughs> still have to do a lot of stuff down there. But how that works is it's a virus with nucleic, nu <laughs> a virus of nucleic acid with attitude. That's what a meme is. And it moves on to susceptible person, AKA Canadians. In that case, as I made fun of Americans. <laughs> it will colonize and infect and it will transmit, it will spread. Some, someday at some point, somebody thought glass or somebody that was smart wore glasses and that spread 
through. I mean, the amazing thing is in today's world, we have the ability to spread memes so, I mean, easier than we've ever seen. Scare, scary, actually. Uh, whether it's a panda sneezing video, you guys seen that one? Or whether it's some people, oh, what, ridiculously photogenic guy? No, what's that one? <laughs> We're gonna have to explain that one later. Google, nobody Google it right now. <laughs> and it's, that's a, <laughs> and that's how, that's how those, those things spread. So what we're gonna do in a second here is I've got a, a really cool yet very temporary prize that we're gonna split the room in half. And I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask one side of the room, we're gonna, you guys will be positive memes. Positive, we'll, we'll even say positive memes within corporate world, whether it's what you do or, your, or, or other leaders in your organization do or other coworkers do. And you guys are gonna be negative, more negative, ideas, negative things in, in the corporate culture that we, that we see or hear. And, and in just a minute, I'll ask you to just, we'll just kind of yell out and I'll, I'll have my, my fancy stopwatch here going. And we'll, whichever team can come up with the most in, we'll say, 20 seconds, uh, will win this cool yet very temporary prize. Trust me, it's a good one, I promise. <laughs> and, but before, I'll let you kind of think about that for a second. But for me, the, the biggest, my biggest pet peeve uh, and people around Emerge hear me say this a lot, is that the biggest pet peeve in, for, for Calgary corporate culture, or even corporate culture these days, is the, is the simple, how you doing today? What's the response that you get from most people? No, no, that's not busy. There it was. Somebody said busy. Busy is what, busy is what we say, right? That's what we say, because if we weren't busy, what are we? Lazy. There you go. That's the perfect explanation of what that busy meme has done to us now. If I say anything but busy, that means that I'm not busy, which means I'm not working hard, which means you, what, am, what good am I? Right. That's the, exactly, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's what happens. And, it's, and it's, it's become this virus. It's become this meme that's spread. And if I, on our team, we had, so that's kind of my, my idea to get you guys your positive memes going, your negative memes going, things that spread. On our team, everybody on my team knew that on race day, and, you know, we'd ask, how you doing today? How you feeling? And one guy would, you know, like my calf is still a little bit. And I would cut him off and go, how you feeling today? He'd go, good. That would be it. Because that's the meme that I wanted in his head before he went out there. All right, saying anything but good, you're still gonna go race, didn't matter. Saying anything but good was going to be a negative meme that was put on, right? So do we have some, you guys are positive, right? Said, do we have some positive memes to yell out at this point? I see some heads shaking, some heads looking like, what are you talking about? All right, so 20 seconds, go. Positive memes from this side in corporate world. What's that? Abundance mentality. What else? You do great work spreading that to people. How about from the back section here? You can't hide. What's that? Happy face with a colon and a smiley on the computers. Yeah, that's actually that's a great one. I haven't thought of that one. What's that? Opportunities to do stuff. So four. We got four from this side. That's in about 20 seconds. Life is good. Five. All right. So you guys are cut off. You guys are cut off now. That's your time is up. All right. So this side. What are the, some of the negative memes in, in, in corporate? world right now. Ready? Go. Happy. Too busy. Stress. Hate my boss. Stress. Stress. Oh, Too much change. Failure. Failure. Entitlement. <laughs> All right, we have a we have a we have a winning team here. <laughs> so is it is it any surprise? Is it any surprise that negativity went out? Our brains, that's how our brains work. We gravitate towards the negative first. If we have a sheet, and I find myself doing this sometimes too, if they have a sheet of, say, five pieces of feedback, and they're four good and one bad, what happens? We feel horrible about that one, and we ignore the four. So you guys actually had, I, I gave the bigger team the positive, so we'll, uh, your cool yet very temporary prize actually I brought today was our Vancouver gold, my Vancouver gold medal. So, it's temporary because I'm going to need it back. 
<laughs> so we'll start it here. And I'll preface this by saying it has been through thousands of kids' hands. It has neither been dropped nor stained. So please don't be that person today. <laughs> And honestly, I was, I've been guilty of, of letting, letting memes pop into my head and me exacerbate the negative. Is anybody here familiar with, with this wheel here? Emotional intelligence. If you guys, if, if we've worked with this with you before, it's an, it's an EQ, it's a wheel that goes through, sorry, some of the, the print on here is small, access range of feelings, positive, negative orientation, self other orientation, balance on thoughts, wants, feelings, and empathy, accuracy, and compassion. And what this is doing is it's telling us how we, how we are when it comes to accessing these sometimes under, under stress or under pressure. And this is actually my EQ wheel. So what it's saying is that I have low empathy. What in my head, what the meme that was placed in is that I have low empathy and compassion. But really, I don't care, so it's OK. <laughs> you guys handled that EQ joke really, really good. But what happened to me was, was the meme that I put in my head, and what this means is access, when, when under stress, access to these things. So if I was writing a quick email, I wouldn't really care about what, was, what I was saying to the other person, I just needed to say it. We do that a lot, we just, not, there's no hello or greetings, it's just boom, this is what we need. But what I found myself doing, what meme could be present here, the meme was that I didn't care. So what started happening? I started caring less. I started caring less. I started saying, you're talking to the guy with low empathy. Don't worry about it. Like, don't expect me to care. And I actually started doing that. And I feel like I'm a relatively, you know, emotionally stable person. But I let that meme pop into my head and take over what I was doing. And that's, if we don't understand the process of memetics, we don't understand the process of how these things spread, then that's going to happen. So what I started doing now is being more conscious of, of how could I myelinate better empathy is at the gas station, having, not only saying how you doing, but actually listening to what the person behind the counter says. And then maybe asking a second question. And I can myelinate my empathy in that, in that way to, to, to be able to you know, hopefully build it and become, and become better at that, that skill that I, was, I feel like I was deficient, in, deficient with. And the, 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 the pretty cool thing about memes is that it's, it's a priming. Memes can be used in a couple different ways. The first thing that happened to you today, how many people here were asked, uh, did Jason come by and type in some questions on his iPad with him? Ask you some very you know, positive questions. What are your, what's your best accomplishment? Things like that. What were the handshake exercises that you did? What were they? They were favorite teacher, all right? Favorite car, favorite car puts you in this Favorite car puts you in this, this, place of, this place of happy. You got to talk about something you really like. Favorite car. Favorite teacher, we put you in a place of learning. Put you in a place of learning. And then our favorite, what was the, uh, the last one was? Employee attributes. What's that? Employee attributes. Favorite employee attributes. So put you in a place of trying to improve, <laughs> in, in, improve yourself, improve the, the employees and your, and your coworkers around you. We primed you. We put a meme in place. Just like as Jason went around and asked you about your accomplishments, we put you in a place of, of learning. Right? There's this great, great priming study that I really won't go into too much, but what it showed was that just a little bit of negative and positive words, the beginning of, a, of an interaction with somebody, just a little word scramble that, that these people had to do, affected their patience by 2 to 300 percent. 2 to 300 percent, just by doing a simple either negative charged word or positive charged word scramble beforehand. So then the thought is, what meme do you bring to a meeting? If you come in, and you come in rushing late, or if somebody asks how you're doing, you, and the first thing you say is busy, or the first thing you do is complain about the traffic, what place does that put everybody in the room in later on? And a really, really great, great experiment that was done was based on six little words. And it's another Dweck study. <clears throat> and what she did was, took a bunch of students, and this is actually probably my favorite study of, of some of the stuff we go through, and took a bunch of students and had them do a whole bunch of puzzles, about 200 students, had them do a, a whole bunch of puzzles, broke them up into two groups. All the kids did their puzzles, and then they went and they gave them their feedback. 
They told them how they did on the puzzle, and then they gave them six simple words. One group, they said, you must be smart at this. Good, you know, here was your, here was your score. You must be smart at this. The other group, you must have worked really hard. Very simple, very, very simple. So what they did was then they moved on and they went on to another round of, of, of puzzles, a little bit harder. They gave the kids, gave the kids a choice. 90% of the kids that were simply given that one six word sentence of you must have worked really hard, 90% of the kids chose to do the harder puzzle in the next round. Majority of the kids who said they were smart, they didn't. Because what does being smart mean? That if you get it wrong, what are you? You're dumb, all right? But the kids who worked really hard, they did it, and they were, they were happy with it. Well, then the third round of puzzles was really, really hard. Everybody had to do it, and none of them did well. But the kids who were simply given that six words of really worked really hard, those kids thought it was fun and kind of cool, and the smart kids, the ones that were told they were smart, hated it. This is a random group of kids, and by the third round, they've already separated them into wanting to work hard and, and being afraid to work hard. And then in the last round, they brought it all back to the first easier level, and what they found was, oh, that's the wrong, there we go. What they found was, when they went back to the baseline equivalent to the first round of testing, the kids who were told that they, you must work really hard at that, actually increased their puzzle scores by 30%. The ones that were told they were smart decreased by 20%. Dweck was so shocked at the significant difference at this, she ran the experiment five more times five more times and got the same exact, the same exact ad. So how does that work when it comes to feedback of the meme that we place on people of what their value is? When it comes to if they did, if they, you know, worked really hard or, if, or even if you think I did a good job today or a bad job today, if, I, if you think I did a good job saying, you're really, you know, you're really good at that. You must be really, you, you must be really good at being on stage. Or you must have worked really hard to be able to do that. And one of the, We'll, we'll bring it back to Classroom Champions, because that's, Lee has to deal with me talking about Classroom Champions a lot. One of the proudest moments for me in that, within this program, is that we had these kids in, these kindergartners in Portland, and they were watching a video of a gymnast who made a special message for them. And not, not the every month message, but a special message. And they watched this, five-year-olds, watch this gymnast do his, you know, all of his stuff. And the reaction was, he must have practiced for so long to do that. When we see that stuff, what do we say? That's amazing. Oh my God, that's so hard. These kids said, wow, he must have practiced really hard to do that. And when the teacher sent that email to me, like it, it, you know, it, it sent shivers down my spine because I understood that we, we, were, we were actually making an impact and these kids were actually starting to get it. So moving along, we'll move now into the last phase of science of success. And what that is, is epigenetics. All right, it's a word that some of you may have heard. Anybody here familiar with the concept of epigenetics? It's a very couple people. Jason, you're not allowed to raise your hand. <coughs> and so, but before we get into epigenetics, we'll talk about genetics, something we all know, right? We all know genetics. We all know that genetics is the study of heredity and the variation of inherited characteristics put very simply and very sciencey. We're gonna get into epigenetics there next. So we know that what genes are. We know that genes make our, you know, our eyes blue and the old, the, the, in essence, the old theory is that we are what our genes are, right? We are, we are this, we are that, we are smart, we are not, et cetera, et cetera, because our genes make us that. And just like a corporate culture, and I've heard it so many times, that's just the way we do things around here. And that's what I want you to have in your head as we go through genetics and epigenetics, is the plasticity that we're finding in our bodies in the genome. If, it's hap if, if the plasticity is capable inside our bodies, how in the world can we not make, it, make everything around us plastic? Right, so I'll start with a little story, and you haven't really had to bear with too many sports analogies today, I don't think, right? I haven't really been going. Well, I haven't been in sports for 20 years before really working in the corporate world. You're going to get one now. So this is a Safa Powell. Safa Powell is a Jamaican sprinter, 100 meter guy. And in the sport world, 100 meter dash is about as genetic as you get. That's about as pure, you know, like these guys are just genetic beasts as you get. 
So what if I were to tell you that there's this other random factor that is actually attributed to success for these guys? If I were to say that the birth order of sprinters is actually the most important, not the most important, I shouldn't say that, is one of the most significant links we can find between the top sprinters in the world. Take a look at this list. These are the, the last 10 world record holders. And at the bottom there, they've actually, they trumped each other, so they're still on the list. Top 10, this is their birth order. Second of three, six of six, four of four, fourth of four, three, third of three, et cetera, et cetera. How strange is that? So is it really, is it, is it if you had two or three people, that would be circumstance. If you have all 10, that's telling us something. And so they're either last or second to last outside of Calvin Smith, which is sixth of eight, but who's counting at that point? <laughs> no offense to anybody with big families. I came with a family of two, so eight seems amazing to me. So what's this, what this telling us is, is it really genetics? Or is it actually the environment we're placed in? Because what happens when you're, anybody here, the youngest sibling? All right, what, hap what happened when you were the youngest sibling growing up? Yeah. Push to get noticed. Play with the older kids. You're always behind. Always behind. Does always behind sound familiar anywhere from myelin? What's that, what's that first way that we grow myelin? Struggle. Struggle. These sprinters were struggling from birth of, how to, of, of what to do, and they had to constantly be constantly struggling. So this, from a myelin standpoint, this makes all kinds of sense, doesn't it? And they repeated it every day because they had to deal with it for 18 years of their life, being the little, being the little sibling. So the struggle and repetition was, bore them into this. And all of a sudden, there were these world-class sprinters. So what's happening? That's the question. What's happening is this, this new science that we can now see, and it's called epigenetics. Epigenetics are traits resulting from external rather than genetic influences. And from our leadership standpoint, we are the results of our environment, our beliefs, and our actions. We are what is around us. And to look a little bit deeper into the science, so we've got our, our DNA, we all know that. And what epigenetics means, epi means on top of. So it's not infiltrating the genetics, it's just sitting on top of our genetics. It's in essence, it's how we express our genes. How our genes are expressed is based on epigenetics, and it's based on these things, there's methyl groups that attach themselves to DNA, and these histones here that attach themselves to the, DNA, to the DNA. And the histones actually loosen and tighten around the DNA to, to express different things. And the amazing thing is we change this through our lives. This is not just given to us and passed down. Epigenetics is the concept that we're not changing the DNA structure, but we're passing it down from one generation to the next. So the things you're doing today are going to affect, if you haven't had kids yet, the things you're doing today will affect kids. They've, they've done tons and tons of, of work showing that these epigenetic markers and traits are passed down the line, and they're passed, and they're seen five, six, seven generations later. They're actually seeing what we're doing in our lives today. So the things that we do right now are having that big of an impact. Well, if we look at this from our relative, relevant standpoint, what's the DNA? It's our, it's our business, it's our work. It's our culture. What are histones? Anybody want to think? Yes? What was the section right before? These are the memes that we place on our culture. And we wrap them in, and we tighten them up, and we loosen them up, and that's how, and that's how our environment and our culture will change. So I'm going to leave you with one last piece of study here, one last experiment that was done. And it was done by taking a look at kids who, who were learning how to play a musical instrument. And this is a really, really interesting one. And, and what this is going to speak to is really why engagement is such a big deal when we look at HR metrics. Why engagement and loyalty is such, a, such an important thing to look at whether these leaders are born or whether the leaders are bred or whether it's this mismatch, whether we hire the best people all the time or whether we train the people that we have and, and make them. And it's kind of a dual, both of those things happen, right? So what they did was they, they did this you know, big group with, with hundreds of kids and they took a look at 
the instrument, they, they started studying them from a young age, like seven years old, right? Seven or eight years old when you start playing an instrument when you're a kid. And what they did was they looked at them longitudinally. So they followed them all the way through to adulthood. And they looked at, you know, how good they got at whatever instrument it was that they chose. And they looked at whether they, they played, you know, for, through, for short term or long term, and they, they looked at quality. And after a year of them, these kids picking up this instrument, and they actually started studying them before they picked their first instrument. After a year, they looked at the performance. They looked at how good they were. And as you can imagine, you had your typical mixed bag, right? You had your normal human bell curve. And it was, you know, some kids were decent, some kids were, some kids were bad, decent, great. And the question is, what was it? What was that X factor that caused us to be good at a skill? Anybody want to guess what's good when it comes to music? What is it? Practice, practice all right. What else? That's, practice is the easy one. I, what else? Like sometimes, sometimes they, and, and, but, but some of the phys, sometimes they look at like even math skills are relevant to, yeah, math skills are relevant to, to how we learn music, audible skills, like how good we hear and can attune into different things. And they looked at a whole gamut of, of reasons why they were good and bad. And, you know, audible skills, no. Math skills, no. None of the math ran. Practice time, believe practice time or not, wasn't the key factor. What was the key factor? They had to go back to a question they asked them before they even started playing their instrument, before they even picked their instrument. And what they did was they asked them, how long do you plan on playing your instrument for? And they, they asked them through primary school, um, through, <clears throat> through high school, to the end of high school, and for the rest of your life. And then they broke it down into short-term, medium-term, and long-term commitments. And what they found was, that, so we've got performance scale on the left, and then average weekly practice. So low, 10, 10 to 20 minutes, moderate, 60 minutes, high, 90 minutes or more. And what they found was that the kids who said they're gonna be in it for the short term, for a year, not even, no matter how hard they practice, they really didn't get past the 10 on the performance scale. But the ones who said they were medium, they're in it for this medium term, all of a sudden, their performance starts to go up. And lastly, long-term commitment. Huge, huge spread. So what does that mean? That means that the number one factor in finding performance is engagement. How committed people are to their organization. Engagement, loyalty. I mean, what this tells us is that as humans, you gain engagement and you gain loyalty, you gain performance, period. That's it. You can take somebody who's, who can work, work really hard but isn't around. I mean, you got somebody who's, who's committed for a low, part, low amount of time, or sorry, who practices for a low amount of time, and they're already beating them to the performance scale. That's such a powerful thing to look at. Isn't it? I mean, I, like, when, we saw, when I saw it, when I came across this, it just was... There you go, that's why that engagement is that number one, that number one factor. So now that we've gone through the gamut of, of the different areas of, of what we consider the science of success and the research and some of the science underneath it, and when we do this work with clients, we really dive into each of these areas a lot deeper and we get the conversations going and we really impact and, and pound in what's happening and what's in there. And when it comes down to it, we want you to really leave here with five really key ideas. The first one being no one name. What those kids do in that first study that I started with way back in the beginning before you had to listen to me for quite this time, this long of a time. And it was Dweck and her, study, her work that said, if you can understand the foundation of what's happening within a system, you will work harder for that system and you will understand it better and you'll conceptualize it. No one name. Have the, have the emotional intelligence to understand what's happening. The second is practice makes myelin. Practice makes myelin. Struggle, repetition, deep practice, focusing on what you're doing, focusing on the skill that you're trying to learn, and having the ability to understand that you can do that. And that's, like I said, 
earlier, the thing that I really, really miss about being an athlete, about being an Olympic athlete and going for that last little bit of performance, and that's what excites me about this work, is that there's, there's so much more to wring out of the sponge within the whole world when it comes to finding performance. But the thing I miss is, is that the details that I could find every day, everything I did, had to do with getting better. And if we can conceptualize that practice makes my own, then we can work on those skills at home, we can work on those skills at the gas station, we can work them on, work on them anytime we're gonna be able to interact with people. We can do that. Rest hard, work hard. Hypertrophy. I'm not gonna sit here and I'm not gonna be that person that says like, we need to just, everybody needs to just relax all the time and do it. I mean, some of you might have corporate policies in place requiring you to take vacation time. Does anybody have where there's, they're starting to roll these things in now where they're forcing people to take their vacation time because they understand what's happening here. They understand that they need, people need to get that rest in order for, for performance to grow and gain. Create a high performance environment. Understanding what the things that we do and say, the cues, the priming, the priming and the feedback, how we interact with people, as well as the, the environment and the culture that we create how that affects performance, and how that affects performance to get those last little bits out of people to make, them, to make them great, great leaders. And lastly, six little words. Those six little words of how we interact with people, which comes off of the, the high performance environment, how we interact with people, and the feedback that we give them in those small little cues that we may or may not be aware of, and how they actually impact people's psyches. And really, the end of the session, we can all now understand how will you myelinate a purposeful mean within the corporate or personal epigenome. It makes a little more sense now. So that is, that is in, in a very condensed nutshell, that is our science of success. I hope it was fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you did learn. I hope you did learn something. I hope your brain is happy that you gained a little bit of, gained even some tidbits of information information that will, help, uh, that will help you along the way. So thank you so much for coming this morning. Natalie's gonna come up here in a second, but uh, thank you so much, everyone. And there's a little gold piece of metal running around here. It should still be here, thank you. into the corporate world. First of all, we're going to do the iPad draw. Um, Steve, would you like to head into the audience and get a, a willing volunteer to who choose we, a card? Who can we trust? <laughs> How appropriate, Kim, that you would get to pick the iPad. Okay, and we have Judy Schmidt. Judy, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Uh, now, next, um, as you know, Pat cannot be with us this morning, so we, we send her, her our well wishes. What we did want to do uh, was really recognize that Pat is, uh, is set to retire here very soon. And uh, one of Pat's passions, again, as many of you will know, is uh, the YMCA. And through the YMCA and, and Pat's volunteering at the YMCA, in lieu of any retirement gifts, Pat decided that she wanted to raise money for uh, a fabulous program called the Strong Kids Program. And so um, but what we do have here, and I, I won't go through the actions, but we would have had a, a check this morning. Um, so what Pat has graciously done is said that whatever money we're able to raise, um, she's actually going to match personally as well. So uh, Emerge will be making a donation to that program. And would you please put your hands together in recognition of, of Pat. I feel like we should sing for She's a Jolly Good Fellow. <laughs> Um, I can't sing, so we won't do that. Um, now, there's another piece of recognition I need to make. Jason, would you please just come out the front so we can see you? 
Uh, Jason Krause, everyone. Jason is another of our Emerge Associates. And uh, Jason is, uh, is very key to the science of success because alongside with Steve and Emerge, uh, you wouldn't have had this amazing presentation this morning. Uh, Jason's been slightly busy in the last little while. Uh, his wife just gave birth to their son last week, so he's been somewhat... <laughs> Congratulations. He's been otherwise engaged, but uh, baby was due today, I think, was it? He was due, due Tuesday, and uh, Jason was talking to the belly and saying, you have to come last week, son, because I need to be at the Emerge event on Thursday. Uh, so thank you to Jason. Now, I don't know if all of you managed to view the blog, uh, the Emerge Learning Event blog. Um, we have a little something for you when you leave this morning, which will have a link to that blog. And we'll have a couple of free giveaways upon the blog. So for example, a copy of this presentation uh, in iBooks format for those of you that have the iPad, and PDF uh, version for those of you that don't. Judy, you can now see it on the <laughs> iPad. <laughs> And a couple of uh, other things. We, we've had the, uh, the video running, so um, please feel free to, uh, to check out the blog. I have to say uh, notes of gratitude, uh, not least, and I feel, this feels like the Oscar ceremony now, uh, the gallery staff, thank you, Michelle, Brenda, uh, all of your team, thank you so much. Uh, Stardust for all of the AV support, Sorrenti's Catering, uh, the Emerge team, our clients, our guests. Is there anybody I've missed? My mum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if I haven't mentioned you, thank you. Uh, it, it really wouldn't have been possible without you. So um, that is all I have to say. And uh, thank you again for coming. Hopefully we're giving you a little bit of a gift of time here. So if you want to stay and uh, enjoy the fabulous artwork, um, network with us, uh, just have a cup of tea and relax. You're very welcome, and I uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.